floppies, you probably can't revive it anymore because the hardware's gone and there's six layers of software that you can't find anymore and there's no help desks to support you. And maybe if you're the National Security Agency, you could retrieve it, but it's pretty tough. What's the, what's the sort of moral lesson there? The lesson is that software uh, lasts if, if somebody cares about it. Because if you cared about it, you'd be porting it to new formats and you'd keep it alive. Uh, the same thing's ultimately going to be true of our lives. It's not that different today. Uh, we're, in fact, not the same stuff. This stuff here that's Ray Kurzweil is completely different than it was six months ago. Almost all the cells turn over in a matter of either days or weeks or months. People say, oh, but the neurons, are this, which is the real seat of your, of your personality, those last forever. Well, okay, the neurons do, but the components of the neurons turns out turn over very quickly, like the tubules get replaced in five days. And so really, all the different parts that make up our physical body within a matter of months is completely different. So what, is there any continuity between what I am today and what I was six months ago? Well, there's a continuity of pattern, uh, kind of like the pattern that water makes in the stream. You see a certain pattern. That pattern may stay the same for hours or even months, but the water that makes up the pattern is changing every few milliseconds. It's really true of the patterns of our lives, too. So it's true in terms of natural biology that it's the pattern, which is to say the information that persists, the actual stuff doesn't. And ultimately, when we can create uh, substrates that can manifest these intelligent processes uh, in similar manners to, to our biological processes and probably do it faster and more capably, we will be able to transfer these patterns from one substrate to another. My name is Ed Lowry. Um, one of your slides predicted that by 2010 we would have effective language technology, I believe. Um, I hope you're right. I have a lot of reason to be doubtful. Uh, I was at MIT about the same time you were doing a thesis on uh, a language for expressing software simply. Uh, for all practical purposes, that uh, technology came to a screeching stop about uh, 10 years later. Uh, technology for expressing software simply. At present, all of the current languages we have are very antiquated in that way compared with what was distributed at IBM in 1974. Uh, Senator Kerry has asked nine different government agencies if they have anyone doing uh, software technology that advanced, and they have all been too embarrassed to answer the question. Uh, there are a lot of um, pretensions to being working on uh, simplifying software, but, they are, but I have found them to be very empty pretensions. Uh, 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 if you know of any organization which is sincerely interested in getting that technology going again, I'd be really interested. Well, let me clarify what, what my position is on language. To really achieve human levels of language requires achieving human levels of intelligence. I mean, that's the uh, insight underlying Turing's uh, articulation of the Turing test, which I think is a, remains the sort of uh, golden standard for measuring uh, human levels of intelligence in a machine. Uh, and the Turing test is based on the ability to emulate through language uh, human levels of conversation. So human language at human levels requires human intelligence. There's no sort of simple algorithm that can emulate human levels of conversation in a convincing manner uh, all of the Turing test, uh, other than really emulating all of human intelligence. So until we get to the late 2020s and non-biological intelligence can achieve that level of human intelligence, we're not going to have human levels of, of language technology. Uh, what we will have in the second decade are useful forms of language technology. We can see actually useful forms already. Uh, there are many systems that involve natural language interactions for simple transactions over the telephone emerging. Uh, language translation is at a useful point for certain types of routine conversations. I have actually used the system I demonstrated to have conversations with someone who spoke a different language. Uh, so we will see uh, use, the ability to converse with machines using natural language for a wide range of, of functions, but uh, not at human levels until we achieve all of human intelligence. Thank you. So 
we're going to let the people in line go ahead and ask their questions, but just keep it focused and limit it to one question. Thank you. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, underlying biology, and it seems like that's a metaphor because uh, you have to have some recognition uh, to uh, it's make information information. It's just a, p a pattern, and it, there has to be some mind to recognize it. And when you use pattern recognition as something that machines can do, you're using a metaphor, too, for what uh, human beings can do. So, so it's like if, if you have, uh, you know, if Big Blue beats Kasparov, uh, who is responsible? It, it, we, we don't put the responsibility on a machine. Ultimately, we work it back to human beings so that if we could talk to a machine and it emulated a human being, uh, we would think the machine was uh, spiritual or intelligent, but only as long as we didn't know it was a machine. Well, I mean, I do think this is a, a human endeavor, as I said. Uh, technology is expanding our human potential. Uh, but I think we will ultimately go beyond biology. At one level, when I talked about our understanding of biological processes as information processes, I'm talking about specific disease and aging processes. So, for example, atherosclerosis, which is an important one. Uh, we actually understand the information processes, six or seven different stages that atherosclerosis goes through, and really understanding the role that different enzymes play and exactly how these biochemical processes work. And have identified quite a few vulnerabilities in the, pro in the disease process that we can attack because we have a growing arsenal of tools that can uh, basically reprogram these biological processes. And there's a lot we can do already with our knowledge to reprogram them, and that's what we talk about in our book. Why do you call but them your, information your, processes instead of just biological processes? Second? Why do you call them information processes instead of just biological processes? Because the, the thing that's changing is that we're understanding biological processes as information processes. We're understanding uh, the key steps that aging goes through, that there's a dozen different processes underlying aging, and we're beginning to understand how the information processes in them work. Uh, we understand that quite well, for example, in atherosclerosis. We understand it fairly well in, in the case of insulin resistance, underlies type 2 diabetes. And we're understanding, and we're in the early stages of this, but again, this is growing exponentially. In 10 or 15 years from now, I believe we'll have really excellent information models and the tools to change them in d directions of greater health and longevity uh, that express in information terms. And the, and the significance of under, expressing them in information terms is that, is that these trends then of the doubling price performance and power and bandwidth capability uh, of information technology that doubles every year is now applicable to biology. That's the key point. But you also alluded to a more philosophical issue is that once we really fully understand biological processes, including our intelligence as information processes, uh, sort of who is the actor? Is there still a human actor? And in my view, this is an expression of our overall civilization that is, has, we are leveraging ourselves with our technology, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, I was wondering if you thought that with the advances that you predict, we will lose a sense of self personally if after being able to experience almost anything in virtual reality and having a life that is longer than we have now and our health will be perfect if we'll lose personal uniqueness? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, first of all, I don't think things are ever perfect at any point in time. Uh, we're sort of amplifying our power to overcome problems, but we also introduce new problems. Uh, we're struggling now with problems, like nuclear proliferation, which is created by our technology. So we have a new problem that by our technology, and that's going to continue uh, both the promise and the peril of our technology. So things will never be perfect. Um, I do think, actually, our uniqueness will increase. I mean, right now, we're very much the same, and we have differences, but there's actually less genetic diversity among all humans on Earth than there is in a single baboon troop. Uh, we're all actually uh, descendants of apparently a very narrow uh, tribe of humans, genetically speaking. Uh, now, we, we do, uh, genes, of course, represent one level of our existence, but then, as I pointed out in the Sarah